So um, we're very pleased to have uh, Sanjay Nawalka as our speaker today. Um, and um, he's um, said he welcomes um, comments or questions at any point during his talk. Uh, let me read you his very impressive bio. He's a professor of finance at the Eisenberg School of Management. His areas of research are fixed income valuation, derivative pricing, and asset pricing. Uh, he chaired the finance department at the Eisenberg School of Management from September 2011 to August 2018. You have my sympathies. He's co-authored four books, Dynamic Term Structure Modeling, Fixed Income Valuation Course, Interest Rate Risk Modeling, and Fixed Income Valuation Course, um, and Closed Form Duration Measures and Strategy Applications. So he's published over 35 scholarly articles in the areas of term structure modeling, risk management, and arbitrage pricing theory. And um, he's here today to tell us about um, P measures, Q measures, and R measures. Sanjay, take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. Let me, uh, yeah, welcome everybody. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to present to your group. I am really looking forward to your comments. And unlike some other conferences where we have a particular format, I would like this to be more informal and just shoot any questions anytime, uh, including the title of the paper, if you don't like. Um, sure. uh, also, I wanted to ba basically, yeah, let me let me start with the uh, uh, screen share of the PowerPoint, and then we can begin. Yeah, okay. So, here's, <clears throat> okay, so here we go. And today, I've ha had a slight challenge with my, uh, uh, just a slight throat issue I had. So every now and then, if I don't speak for like one second, you know, uh, I'll speak. Don't worry, I will not go away. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the title of the paper is A Theory of Equivalent Expectation Measures for Expected Prices of Contingent Claims. In fact, I would like to engage your group on one question, and Peter, you especially, can you think uh, another title of this, uh, which, which one would have a longer lasting life. So the other title is this, a theory of equivalent expectation measures for expected returns of contingent claims. So just keep the thought, okay. you don't have to answer now. Okay. But when I go through the whole paper, I would like some feedback, you know, like, should we just change that to expected returns? You know, that might, that's like the main contribution anyway. So, okay. and from expected prices come expected returns. So um, here's the motivation. You know, you have uh, in investment world, basically you have equities, fixed income and derivatives, which may include commodities and all those kinds of securities. So th that's our investment world. And of course you've got real estate and other things, but these are the main areas that Wall Street looks at. And in equity research, it's really more about expected returns. Uh, so there's all kinds of models from CAPM to APT to Fama in French um, and, and, you know, probably hundreds and maybe thousands of papers about expected returns. And why Why about expected returns? Uh, as opposed to, for example, valuation. How many professors can value an IBM stock or a Google stock? We don't do that. We do expected returns on an IBM or Google. But why? Because as academics, we have very little idea about future cash flows, which tends to be the main element in stock analysis and we don't know how to form those expectations about future cash flows, but discount rates are easier to estimate, which is related to expected returns, you know, uh, whether you use CAPM, APT, Pharma, French, or whatever. So that's where the equity research is focused. Fixed income and derivatives research, uh, and let me, that's more about valuations. So uh, here, if you look at uh, the number of papers out there, you'll find uh, relatively, very few papers on expected returns. There are papers. There are papers on corporate bond returns. There's all this research on, you know, the term structure hypotheses, uh, which tend to be about, you know, the liquidity premium and all that. So there are papers like that, but predominantly we're dealing with valuation over here. Why? Because future cash flows are certain or contingent on other assets whose valuations exist. And so uh, based on those valuations or the contingent cash flows, we can figure out the valuations of the securities we're looking at. So just by whatever historical reasons or tradition or uh, the mathematical reasons, whatever, this is what our world is. In equities, we do expected returns and fixed income, we do valuations. Of course, uh, there are exceptions to this. There are papers on valuations and equities and there are papers on returns and fixed income. 
Now, why more research does not exist on expected returns in fixed income and derivative securities? Well, uh, for, for <clears throat> bonds, for centuries, managers have looked at promise yields on bonds. In fact, there's a recent paper, Becker and Ivashina, the, they show that managers maximize yields in not expected returns. Uh, common to use metrics based upon yield, rating, sector, industry, optionality, and default probability to make portfolio holding decisions. Uh, yeah, so you, I you, make, I'd like to make a comment. Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah. so there's a well-known derivative security called the futures contract. Yeah. And um, it, it turns out it costs zero <laughs> to enter into a futures contract. So like if you, if you define expected return as expected value of like future value divided by cost of getting into it, you, you immediately run into a mathematical issue uh, that you're dividing by zero. Um, so that's one, <laughs> one issue, <laughs> uh, you know, in that particular derivative security, which is not just futures, it's also swaps are costless to enter forward contracts and so on. So, you know, just make that point. That, that is a really good point. That's one of the reasons why the title of the paper is expected prices. You know? Oh, okay. <laughs> Even right. if it is zero, uh, we can get the expected price of it, you know, <laughs> because they expected, uh, there'll be an expected uh, price of the whole swap at any time H. So that still works. But I yep. know you, what do you divide that by the denominator? So there are some researchers who just for simplicity of, you know, uh, computation, they'll divide it by notional value, but but with the caveat that, you know, that's really not expected returns. It's, you know, it just gives you some denominator to make sense, you know, mm -hmm. you know. To compare so, across. To compare across, whatever. Yeah. But, but if you use it properly, then, you know, that can be used, but but uh, but that's a fair point, yeah. yeah. So, um, uh, but, but in, in like, you know, corporate bonds, where you got so many bond portfolios, uh, uh, even you got firms like, you said firms like Barai and all these consulting firms, they do a lot of this, but I've not seen uh, even mutual fund managers or, or uh, bond researchers come up with a number like, this is the expected return, we think of this bond portfolio like we do in equities. You know? We do, you know, with different equity portfolios, we can try to get an, get an estimate of expected return. But still, even in bonds, they got to make money. They got to make expected returns. But, you know, they do some combinations of yield rating, optionality, and all that. And they get some kind of subjective idea what the expected return would be. A lot of them are maximizing yields, as Becker and Ivashina found from studying the insurance companies. And uh, derivatives are views, viewed as tools of hedging risk, and not much attention is paid on returns. And a lot of times the data is illiquid or not available. So that could be one of the reasons. So for different reasons, we don't do that. And this paper, we're hoping to give a, a way to get analytical solutions of fixed income securities, including treasury bonds, corporate bonds, all, even mortgage bonds. We haven't talked about them here, but they're also valued under Q. So they can be also handled here and all kinds of financial derivatives. Uh, so for them, what would be a general way to get the future expected price, or I would say expected future price at a horizon H, which is a fixed horizon H in your mind, how would you get that? You would think that something like that would be available, but it's not. So like if I were to uh, uh, tell you that, uh, take any model, Heston model, and the call option expires in three months and I tell you what's the expected value of the call price after one month. You would think an analytical solution would exist in finance by now. It doesn't exist. Uh, it exists only for Black-Scholes formula that Rubinstein did in 1984. So, so in general, for an arbitrary horizon, expected price solutions don't exact, exist, except for two cases. One is terminal date. So terminal date of a treasury bond is just $1 if you know you want to look at a pure discount bond or $100 or $1,000 face value. So that obviously there, but let's say terminal uh, expected price of a call option. For that solutions actually do exist. It's just that they were not noted until Brody, Shurnav and Johans brought this to the attention that the formula is because it is it does not have discounting 
you can simply solve this equ equation using standard procedures. You, know. you can, you know, this will exist even for Black Scholes or Heston or using Fourier transforms also. There's no discounting here. So you just, the ST grows as a sum process and this expectation can be solved in closed form. So, so for terminal value. I make a point. Um, so yeah. um, prior to Black Scholes, um, you know, people wanted to value options. And, um, you know, they basically did take the expectation of the terminal payoff and then discount at some rate appropriate for the call. Um, yep. So if you just didn't do that last step, then all those people did what you're looking for. So I'm thinking of like papers by, you mean, you know, I mean, like people before Black Scholes, so um, <laughs> Boness, <laughs> for example. Yeah. Yep. yeah, thank you. So let's talk about Boness. So Boness did what I just said, which is the computed expected value under P of a call's payoff. And then he said, let's discount at some rate that's appropriate okay. for a call. So if you just didn't do that last step, you know, which is like, it's easy to, you know, not do that last step. You just, okay, then anyway, he was doing it. So I, I think he should, you know, I wouldn't I, say it was first done by those people. That's a very good point. And we will mention that very fair point. And, and I think I, I'm going to put that in the maybe a footnote or something right below that this that this problem has been done for simpler models like Black Scholes. But I think Brody Chernoff and Johans note this for any any models for which Yeah, okay, the, that's fair. I mean with Bonessa was log normal. And okay. Bonessa was log normal. Yeah. But but that's a fair because this paper has some historical aspects. I I do want to be fair and I want to mention all those things also. So we'll definitely put a footnote there. Very good point. So uh hold on I think uh does this image show also like of us there so that prevents us from seeing this here or, or you yeah, yeah, yeah if you're blocked it's because you're you have to move your uh your, there's a way to hide those controls if you do the. Oh, i can time. hide that yeah you yeah. can hide them yeah, 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 yeah. So, so we're so, seeing what's at the top yeah I, I sometimes also like to see faces also but then i'll keep switching back and forth okay okay so so expected prices uh in different worlds so we can have mm -hmm. A P world, which is a physical world, and it's not true that in physical world you have no formulas. There are there are formulas when you are looking at expected terminal price. For that, as Brody Chernoff Johans showed, that formulas do exist. Then another world is the Q world. In the Q world, uh, you know, starting from Black Scholes, Merton, then Cox Ross, and everybody who followed after that, and you know, Harrison and Krebs, and all of them. The whole thing about the Q world is it can get you the expected price today of a contingent claim using the Q measure. Uh, the numerical methods are also simple, trees and all, and analytical solutions also exist. So this was discovered by Black Scholes Merton and then extended by many people, but the solutions exist at current time, which is all time T. Now, what if you wanted expected prices at time H? <coughs> This is the physical expected price at time H. How would you do it? And this is what I was saying in the beginning that you would think that this would be in the natural order of uh, uh, how research evolves, that at some point after 1979, Harrison Krebs and some of that work, we would have come to this, you know, like what's, how do we get the expected price at time H under very general conditions? Sometimes research doesn't go non-linearly. So I think it's been, of 47 years since all of this was discovered. And there was a little trick. And the trick is basically simple, that you create another measure R, which is a combination of the two probabilities. So in the first world I showed you, there was just physical probabilities. Next world were Q probabilities. But what if you combine them? You have physical transition probabilities. So from any period to any period between 0 and H, from, from 0 until H. Uh, you've got P probabilities. Uh, so right before H uh, and until H. And uh, then right beginning from H, you have Q transition probabilities until T. And suppose you just create a, just force it. You know, this is the physical probabilities and on all the nodes at time H, you start doing Q probabilities. If you were to do that, you get the R measure. So that's in a nutshell, the whole paper. That's what we do in a nutshell. The R, R world allows an analytical solution of the expected price of a contingent claim at a finite horizon H. So as H changes, you will get a different R measure. So R measure is relative to H. And can, I say, uh, can I jump in? I mean, I think yeah. 
Yep. If your goal is to get an analytical solution under R, you're going to need to be able to have analytical solutions under P and Q, since yes. they're just special cases. Yes. Um, is that right? So that is right. And so the concept, you know, whether or not there's an analytical solution, yep. is independent of the concept of R, right? Like, I mean, if I wanted to use Monte Carlo to get to solve the problem at the top of the slide, because I have a very realistic model that is not amenable to analytic solutions, I could. Yep. Right, so yeah. I don't think I feel like your concept R is independent of whether or not there's an analytical solution. Uh, yes, uh, whether an analytical solution exists, generally, if it exists under P, basically in how we are talking at the terminal date, it will generally exist under Q at small time t and generally exist under R at time h, unless market prices of risks are totally wild. But if market prices of risks are well defined, you know, if a fine remains a fine under Q, P, and R, then it'll go through all three of them. So either they'll exist in all three or they won't exist under any of them. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so, yeah. so under, under certain processes, they won't exist. And, right. uh, but they don't exist. Uh, even Q valuation doesn't exist, age <clears throat> expectation doesn't exist, time T to expect terminal price doesn't exist, for, and none of the expectations would exist. But yeah, so if either Q exists or Q valuation exists or P expectation exists at, at capital T, then under R, uh, this is what we do in the paper. We compute the expectation of the uh, contingent claims price at time H. That's all this, what this, all this paper does. But things get slightly more interesting because Q is not the only measure we use. Sometimes for valuation, we use forward measures. And forward measures are just, you know, transformations of, uh, you know, Q and P. And you, you, uh, there's a way to get the. Basically, you use the pure discount bound as a numerator instead of using money market as a numerator. When you use money market as a numerator, you get Q. When you use the pure discount bound maturing at time capital T as a numerator, you get forward measure QT. And certain kind of problems like bond options or corporate bonds, like call into frame Goldstein model they will be solved using QT, which is the forward measure. <clears throat> so if you have that, then corresponding to the QT, you will have something called RT, which will again have the same concept, P transition probs until time H, and then QT transition probs from H to capital T. So if there's a bond option that can be solved, the expectation can be solved at time H, then we're hoping that RT could solve the expected value of the bond option at time h. However, it gets a little more complex than that. RT does not exactly solve it. We have, we have to make a slight adjustment and you'll see the reason why when I show you the equations. And we have to create something called R1t. So basically the QT transition props, which are the forward uh, measure transition props from h to capital T remain the same, they're the same. But the P transition, transition props just are adjusted slightly by the pure discount bond. Uh, uh, there's a little term that comes in and uh, you need to adjust that. And most of the uh, uh, problems where you can solve the valuation using the forward measure at current time, for most of those problems, you solve the expected price at time H using R1T. So not RT. So that's a little, uh, complexity that comes in. And the one is for a different class of R measures. By the way, I was again gonna forget to tell you this. This whole R thing uh, was discovered by Peter in another paper, <laughs> but he used it for something else. And uh, it was a, such a coincidence that we were talking about R, Hussein sent me his paper and there was this R everywhere. And Shayang and I, and I forgot to introduce Shayang too. She's also watching the presentation, my collaborator. Uh, she, she's been an equal partner in this whole research and she's watching from Beijing. So when she and I saw this and we were like, our paper is R. So we're like, what do we do now? So, and then Peter and I got talking and Peter was very kind and generous. And he looked at our paper and he said, I bequeath this measure to you. So we have inherited this from Peter Carr. Thank you, Peter. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> so, that's the story of R. So anyway, um, this is the R1T world. And, and we will see there are two classes of R measures, R 
measures and R1 measures, as we'll see, there's, there's a little bit of, uh, once I introduce you the whole notation, things will become clear and hopefully you won't get confused. But right now I'm just keeping it simple. Um, so now to start this paper, let's uh, look at the intuition. The intuition is uh, not that complicated. Here's a stock price tree, like the Cox, Ross, and Rubinstein binomial model. This is the up probability. This is the down probability computed in the same way as Cox, Ross, Rubinstein did. Stock price starts at 100, jumps up and down, um, and then you know constant you know volatility jumps up and down, and then when you come to H, then what happens is from this node. You go, sorry, I did not mention this. These probabilities are physical probabilities. In Cox, Ross, Rubinstein's, these are risk neutral probabilities. So though there is, a, there is one difference from zero to H, you do it like Cox, Ross, Rubinstein, but in the computation, you don't use risk neutral probabilities. This is physical up, physical down, physical up, physical down. When you can come to time H, that is when you start using risk neutral probabilities like Cox, Ross, Rubinstein. So we are from physical, you switch to risk neutral. So suppose this was the, was the probability structure. Then this probability tree would be the R probability tree. That's what we call R. R is simply remaining P until H, becoming Q after H in terms of transition probabilities. And the intuition is not that complicated because you're trying to solve in this case, the expected call price. And this is the terminal value of the call prices, which you get from the from this stock prices on this date. And you value these terminal call prices using Q measure and which is standard. So you get values at uh, time two. These are the call prices, 37.94 and 8.85 and zero. Standard risk neutral valuation. And from here on, you do not do any discounting. You simply take the P expectation, physical expectation of these three values over here. So this is a physical expectation, physical expectation of these values. And then you take a physical expectation here. So you get the expected price at time zero of the call at a finite horizon, which in this case is two periods. This is in a nutshell, the intuition of this paper. But things get complicated because of the forward measure and things like that, and we'll go over that, you know, but that's the basic intuition. So now, even though it's got a simple framework, it has very general uh, uh, connections to the finance field with a lot of interesting papers. So we develop a, the, the, the new R measures, we call them equivalent expectation measures and EEMs, and these equivalent expectation measures are not Martingale measures. So how are they related to the Martingale measures? That's what we are going to show. So you have Martingale pricing theory by Harrison and Krebs and uh, Harrison and Pliska. So we extend that to the equivalent, mar equivalent, expectation, equivalent expectation measure theory. And as a special case of the EEM theory, we get the Martingale pricing theory. Then another set of applications are, uh, there are transforms uh, which are given by Bakshi and Madan and Duffy Pan Singleton. These were the very general extensions of the approach of Heston. Heston was the first one to give a, what, we, what we've called in, in this paper, Q transforms to distinguish them from our transforms. But the original papers just called them transforms. So Heston is the first Fourier transform and then Bakshi and Madan and Duffy give, give uh, a similar transform, but they generalize them more. So they allow multiple state variables. They allow different boundary conditions instead of just a call option. And they show that these transforms are so powerful that they can handle things like Asian options and, and different boundary conditions, different kinds of stochastic processes, even more complicated than Heston. All of those problems can be solved. And so we, they do them for valuation. We generalize this, uh, these transforms to our transforms and we do them for expected prices. So if there is a valuation solution using any of these models, then 
uh, you will get a expected price solution using our transfer. The final contribution of this paper is that it extends the framework of Breeder and Litzenberger, who discovered the state, they didn't discover, sorry, but they formalized it a little more, it, its connection to option pricing. It was discovered by Arrow and Debru, the you know, state price um, idea, which is, you know, price, Arrow Debru prices are, you know, uh, you all know Arrow Debru prices. So, so they generally, they, uh, Breed and Litzenberger took the Arrow Debru prices and connected them to the call price function. So they showed that the second derivative of the call price function is the Arrow, the arrow Debru densi density in, the, in, in a continuous distribution. We generalize this to a new concept called the expected future state price density. And uh, using that, we're able to get a couple of powerful results, which I will talk about later. So th these are the three main contributions uh, in terms of the relationships with the existing literature. And the kind of questions we can answer with the existing literature, suppose you have a, you know, Di Singleton have a famous paper on the affine models and suppose there's a 10 year treasury bond and you need expected price of that bond over the next two, after the next two months under A13 models. So we can, this R framework will give you the expected price as a closed form solution, which until now did not exist in a way you could do it numerically, but not as an analytical solution. Then suppose you had, an, uh, had a model of say June bond 2002 or CGMY model Peter Carr and his other famous authors uh, from 2002, uh, which is a very famous levy model. And suppose you wanted to get uh, the expected price after one month, then we can generalize that and the internet appendix in our paper has those kind of solutions. Suppose you had a corporate bond. There's a famous paper by Colin Dufresne Goldstein in 2001. So suppose you wanted it's you know, expected price, which would give you the expected return over the next quarter, then you can get a closed form solution using again, in this case, R1T measure, which is a kind of related to the R measure. And suppose you had a long position in interest rate cap over the next quarter, and you wanted to get expected price and expected return under the QTSM3 model of Andit Margallant, which is a quadratic model, you could do that. So, so the applications are very general all fixed income and derivative models, wherever Q is used, wherever it is used, and wherever you have analytical or numerical solutions, you can get analytical and numerical solutions using our measures. So overall, uh, you know, the paper does basically, as a summary, it derives a theory of equivalent expectation measures, which are mainly three measures we focus on, the R measure, the R1T measure, and another one called R1S measure, which is for exchange options, where uh, you exchange one asset for another. We get R transform and extended R transform, which uh, are extensions of uh, uh, Bakshi and Madan and Duffy Pan Singleton. And we apply them to these different models, the different uh, options. And then the new concept of expected future state price density. This allows the computation of the future price of a complex of complex contingent claims and the estimation of underlying assets physical density using the expected prices of standard European calls and puts. So you got, let's say for uh, different strikes, you can somehow get, we will get into that later, somehow get expected future prices of standard European calls and puts. Then you can use the methodology, uh, the results on this paper to get the expected future price of any complex European claim with an yeah. arbitrary- Just quickly comment that yeah. you left out the word expected in the text, you said it, but it's not there in the text. So- Oh yeah. So your, your fourth yeah. line from the bottom, you want the word expected in front of future, right? Uh, expected uh, in front of few, yeah, yeah, yeah. Computation of the exactly, thank you. Thank you for that. Expect okay. future prices of complex claims, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is like even as I'm speaking, I didn't note it. You know, that, that's oh, okay. why I need another pair of eyes to look at <laughs> what we're doing, because I'm just assuming. Thank you. Yeah. So here's the whole uh, setup. So we have two classes of measures. In, in fact, there's a third class, but that third class is not very useful. 
we show that in the appendix and a footnote. footnote. And I'll show you now how we develop these uh, two classes of measures. So we begin with the basic result that, uh, that this result was kind of implied in Harrison and Krebs and Giemann was the one who kind of formalized it more, uh, Heliot Giemann. So ba basically any price ratio, of ratio of two assets, you know, if, if, if you take a price of one asset you know, and divide by the price of another asset, then uh, a relationship exists, you know, with respect to any, any of these ratios where you have a particular numerator, the one that is dividing, in this case is G, that's the numerator. So for any numerator, you'll have a relationship that the discounted prices of the assets are martingale and, and a martingale measure has to exist, otherwise there will be arbitrage. So if you've got F as your underlying, you know, the security that you're trying to value and G is the numerator, then F of small t divided by G of small t has to equal, has to be a martingale under some measure Q star. So we're calling it Q star. Now you might be, uh, don't want to, you know, get the audience to get lost. So we're keeping star as the most general definition of measures when the numerator has not been specified. So star will be when G can be any numerator. It could be money market, it could be pure discount bond, it could be another asset. So Q star is a you know general. Yeah, definition. just a quick comment. When I use the letter R in my talk, I used it for Q star. <laughs> so anyway, so just so you know how I was using it, I was using it to mean any that, measure. Um, okay. Yeah. Anyway. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, and, and then when you have that, then there's a radon Nicodem derivative that exists uh, with, respect, with respect to P, which is L star. And uh, if you just take that previous equation and put it equation three, and this part, if you substitute that, over here. Um, so if you go back and uh, if you take this part, that is a part that I'll be substituting at a future time h. So imagine this small t becomes h. So then this will become g of h and this will become f of h. And so we, so then this whole thing is f of h. And that's why it is expectation at time of f of h. So now you've got a P expectation of you're trying to get expected price on the physical measure of uh, F of H, which is all of this. We're trying to get that, but you've got two different measures. So you cannot take iterated expectations. So the idea is quite straightforward. You do this. And this was the, I guess, the intuitive idea behind this whole paper. Condition one, you make the condition P probabilities at time t of events occurring at time h, you find a measure, called, you call it R star, such that the conditional p probabilities at time t of events occurring at time h are the same as the corresponding R star probabilities of those events. So this p then will become R star, okay? Because all of this is uh, at time h, right? Condition C2, the conditional Q star probabilities at time h which are these probabilities here of events occurring at time capital T are the same as condi corresponding conditional R star probabilities. Basically construct a measure R star so that from small time T to H, P is R star and from H to capital T, Q star is R star. You can construct a measure like that. And uh, these are the two conditions. If you construct the measure like that, then this P is R star, this Q star is R star. Now you got the same measure. You got the same measure, then you can use the law of iterated expectation, expectations, and then you get this relationship here. And this is what we needed. We can use this uh, as corollary one will show, this will simplify depending upon the numerator. But this does not solve all our problems. Just like Q does not solve bond option problem, you need the forward measure. So for some problems that are not solved by R star, we do this trick. We divide and multiply by uh, the term, this term here. So this term is here, and then this term is here. So you can always uh, do this trick to, to basically get an expectation uh, 
when you're, you you can you know cre create this expectation as a product of two expectations where these three terms gh times ft times gt now have been separated into two terms one is the gh and another is ft divided by gt now this gt is nice because if this is a pure discount bond at capital t then it would equal one so it really you know becomes expectation of f capital t under r1 star so it will help us here so we basically taken one expectation and divided as a product of two expectations using this trick. Only thing with this trick is, well, this is just simple mathematics. Now, it took us some time uh, to get the radon nicotine derivative uh, because this just shows you a mathematical relationship, but what's a radon nicotine der derivative of R1 star with R star? And it took us some time to, to dig into that and Shayan, you really helped out in that. And, and we were able to figure it out. It was not that complicated, but when you don't know that, you know, how do you get it? It was kind of a little bit of a challenge. So this is our theorem. These are now the formal radon nicotine derivatives of R star with respect to P and R1 star with respect to P. It turns out that the radon nicotine derivative of R with respect to P is, if you remember this L star and L, this L star is simply the radon nicotine derivative of Q star with P, which we had introduced a few slides ago. So if you take the ratio of the radon nicotine derivatives of Q star with P at time S and at time H, you take that ratio and that holds from time H until time capital T. And if you just put one over here, which is from time zero to capital H until right before capital H, then this one has the intuition that you remember from zero to H, it is a physical measure. So you want the radon nicotine derivative to be one from zero to H because this R star should be physical measure until time H. And here, this ratio will make it R star and the proof is in the appendix. I mean, if you, once you do this condition C1 will be satisfied and condition C2 will be satisfied with which were the two conditions. Now for R1 star, it's not that complicated, but it, it took us some time to figure this out, but this is the radon nicotine derivative. It works and it's got this adjustment term. This adjustment term is a little bit of a problem, because, not problem, but this is what creates R1T because uh, if it's a pure discount bound, then this is the price of the pure discount bound at time H divided by time zero expectation under the physical measure of the pure discount bond at time h. This is the this is under physical measure. So this is the adjustment term that I was talking about under R1T measure. You know, this is a slight adjustment, but it only needs physical measure information, it does not need risk neutral information. And that creates a little bit of an uh, issue. So that gives you R1 star. Now remember these star measures did not have any numerators, they, they, could, they were valid for any numerator. It could be money market, it could be a uh, pure discount bond, it could be another asset. So they're derived under very, very general assumptions. So now what we will do is we will, uh, first of all, before I go there, once you have these radon nicotine derivatives are in equations five and six, which we had derived before, it, would, it can be shown that they do hold true. You know, just, you don't just needed those radon nicotine derivatives and this will work everything works fine. From this, we get our corollary one. And so before I get into this, let me just say this, we have two kinds of measures, R star measures and R1 star. R star measure with any numerator and R1 star measure with any numerator. So suppose the three commonly used numerators in finance are money market account, pure discount bond, which gives you forward measure and an arbitrary asset which would be used for some exchange traded options like the Margrave model. So those are the three numerators, you know, just uh, money market or pure discount bond or any asset like IBM asset or whatever. So if you have two kinds of measures, R star and R1 star, and you have three numerators, you'll get a total of six R measures. So we have a little bit of a, a, a table in the, in the, um, in the uh, paper, uh, we gave at the end, which I don't have it here. 
in which we show that that uh, R star for money market, we call it R, okay? And R star, when you have a pure discount bond, we call it RT. And when R star is for arbitrary asset, we call it RS. R1 star, when you have it for money market, we just call it R1, like you have R, so we just have R1. When you have it for pure discount bond, we call it R1T, which is this R1T. And then when you have it for arbitrary traded asset, we call it R1S. So we have six uh, R measures, but we find only three are needed for doing almost, we haven't found a single application finance where we need the other three R measures. So there, we have not found a use for a simple R1 measure, we've not found a use. And if you were to talk about RT, we've not found a use. So R, R1T and R1S, these are the three measures out of the six, which solve every problem in finance. That's kind of No, that's good, you're going too far there. <laughs> Sorry, uh, so I mean, um, so, so for example, I mean, people use forward starting annuities as new rares when they're valuing swaptions, okay? I mean, so, you know, you're leaving out a lot of the finance literature. Uh, so I, I feel it's a bit of a strong statement. So, um, but I feel that, you know, it's like the notation gets a little overwhelming when you it is do like you're sort of placing too much emphasis on names of things in my opinion i mean all that really matters <laughs> is uh you know the sort of mathematical nature of these things not what they're called so um you know so i was just saying that so that in the in later on when we discuss different things mm -hmm. so that there is a framework where did r1t come from it came from equation six, which is R1 star measures with identified with numeraire pure discount bond. So you have a map where these measures are coming from. That was the only thing. So if you look at the table, the last table in the paper is got basically on one axis, it's a two by two or three by two. So on one side is the three different numeraires, on the other side is R1 and R, R star. Yeah. And R. Like, and okay, let me make this point. So the third, your very last bullet point, the numerator asset is any arbitrary traded asset. So yep. it's any arbitrary traded asset, what if it was a pure discount bond? I mean, oh yeah, then it becomes R1T. Right, yeah. so like what's the point of picking out special cases when you've got- uh, the for, for Margrave model, for example, if you have an option to exchange IBM stock for Xerox stock, mm -hmm. then there is no money market entering anywhere. Yes. In the Margrave solution, you will just have IBM price process and Xerox price process. Does Xerox even exist? I don't even know. I, I'm using examples. Yeah, okay, that's fine. <laughs> so I agree with that statement of yours. And so, um, then you, you would know, need this. But, yeah. uh, I'm just saying, okay, so you're right. And, um, you know, and I'm saying if I then wanted to go from the exchange option to a, a standard option with a fixed strike price instead of a random strike price so to speak i could say okay the uh the thing i previously called xerox is now a pure discount bond yeah and um you know i got it right so so then, like, it, then it would become r1t here? yeah and in fact and then it would become r1t and r1t itself if we were to assume that the uh money market account has a constant interest rate no stochastic interest rates will become r so r1t will become r so r1s is the most general any asset and if that is a pure discount bond, it becomes R1T. And if that pure discount bond has constant interest rate, then it becomes R. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so in that way. And your comment about the forward start options, I did think about it. So uh, that has some interesting uh, connection with this, but we've, we've not, we, we should do that. We should look at some value, uh, expected price of a forward start option. Only comment I would make there is that in the literature, even whatever they're doing at forward start options, still they're do, using Q measure to do valuation only. They're not doing expected price at a future horizon age. So even if even if the it's not Q measure to, actually, I mean it's called forward. It's called annuity measure is what people call it. So but it, uh, but it's, it's like you, could, you mean by Q that the money market account is the numerator, and then I have to object no because it's not what they're using. Okay, so you, they're using an annuity as a numerator. Yes. Okay. Uh, in fact, okay. it's a forward starting annuity. So it Got starts, it. the first payment is sort of off, you know, deferred. So it would be in the class of what I would call Q class, which is Q, Q1T, Q, sorry, not, there's no one there, Q, QT, which is forward measure, Q1, 
QS, which is the Margrave exchange measure, then you can have another Q, call it an annuity. It is still in the class of Q measures. So in the, in the sense, it is not using any physical probabilities, right? It is right. using some kind of, yeah. yeah. That's, that's yeah, I mean, if you want, if you use Q, you'll confuse people because let's say that letter has been associated with the numerator being the money market account. So my suggestion is you talk about this word called equivalent martingale measure, okay? And oh, um, that's a great idea. So, so it could, that is still EMM. The yes. ports are still using so, EMM. You, I know you're trying to talk about just pricing as opposed to computing expected values under P. I, I, I know that's what you're thinking. And um, like I'm saying that if you do want to refer to pricing as opposed to computing expected values under P, then just as language, if you talk about equivalent Martingale measures, you know, that's such a sort of vague word. It includes, you know, every measure ever used to do pricing that, you know, it'll capture everything you're trying to say. That's a good, that, that's a good way to do it. So, so, so that the port sort option would use an equivalent Martingale measure. Yes, it would. If you want to compute the expected to the horizon edge of the forward start option, then you would need to use equivalent uh, expectation measure. So that would be the only comment. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So we'll just keep moving forward. So uh, here are some simple applications. So we begin with Black Scholes because it's the intuition is the clearest with this. So here's a physical process uh, under the geometric grinding motion. Here's a risk neutral process, uh, and use use your son of theorem to do the change of measure. And then uh, we show that the R Weiner process will be connected to the, it, it is connected to both P and Q, but you can write it uh, as something like this. It is the P Weiner process plus this integral. Now, if, if this was Q, if it was not R, then this inequality would not have been there. But this inequality simply says that the market price of risk becomes effective only after time h. Only after time h, it becomes q. Before time h, it remains p. So that's basically the Weiner process, uh, how it is related. And the stock price process would become this. This is very intuitive in one way that suppose we were not using Black Scholes for model. Suppose this was some other process, a CEV process or any other process complicated processes where we had mu and r uh, under p and q. So whatever this mu was, it was some complicated term, you know, with three terms in it maybe or whatever it was. But just by inspection, you could write the r process just uh, with the indication indicator function for, for the time less than h. You would multiply it by the physical drift and when with the indicator function you have time greater than h or equal to h, you would multiply that by the risk neutral rate. And so this is not just for Black Scholes, this will hold, this trick will hold for any process. And for Black Scholes, it just turns out once you uh, put that uh, process, then you just take its expectation at, uh, uh, at time h, you take its current expectation, just using standard results, you will get this solution. There's a derivation in the appendix in two, three lines, you will get the solution. This was first discovered by Rubinstein and uh, in 1984, but his solution required uh, a property with double integrals with uh, normal variables and he used some trick to get this, the same solution. But ours is a much simpler way of getting the same answer. Now, this has a, a little more interesting applications when you look at uh, other models, like a fine term structure models, a guy in singleton, you've got end state variables and you've got physical process. You know, this is a whole vector notation. This is a matrix of, you know, end state variables. These are the market price of risk. So the way you will get the R process is if you add Q, then there would not be this indicator function. And this would be a Q process. But with this indicator function, this becomes the R process. And uh, under this process, these would be the solutions. The solutions are similar to the solutions of valuations, you know, with Diane Singleton, except they have these H terms. So, so there's this T minus H, H minus T, H minus T. Basically, wherever you have uh, the uh, H minus T, 
that is kind of using this K and uh, this uh, phi. These are physical parameters. The star parameters are risk neutral parameters. Um, and in the boundary condition of this solution B1, which would solve from H to capital T, you've got the risk neutral parameters. Basically, from H to capital T, uh, it, it, the solution works with risk neutral parameters. And then that solution from from H to small t will work on the physical measure. So you get this whole solution, and this is under very general conditions under all classes of affine models, A0, you know, did they have AM, N, M is the number of square root processes, N is the number of state variables, you know, they've got different classes of affine models. This is very general. And as an application, if you look at the Vasicek model, then here's the solution resembles the Vasicek's original solution in terms of, you know, the, what it looks like, but it's got some terms which have H in it, but, you know, not too much more complicated. And now this solution is very general, this closed form solution, you have H in it. You could change H and get the price at any horizon. So if you make H equal to small t current time, it reduces to the Vasicek solution. And that's kind of nice. So then the nice application, which we didn't have in the first version of the paper, uh, but it was there when I presented recently when Peter, you came to the CISDM conference, is that we extended it to the Merton model under, very, under some general conditions. And interestingly, Merton model requires R1T measure to solve mm -hmm. for bond option. And uh, these are the processes. This comes from equation six, basically. And then, you know, you divide it by the numerator because this is one P capital T, T is one. So you can always divide it like that, sorry. And that makes it, uh, th th that makes it this, you know, uh, a process, a discounted process, VT. And uh, then using the standard mathematics of, you know, how to solve this under log normal, we have to make uh, two assumptions uh, so that everything remains log normal. The physical drift of the acid price process has to be of this form. It can have a stochastic riskless rate plus market price of you know risk. This could be like a APT or a ICAPM or any kind of model, but the drift here, this drift term is deterministic. So most of these ICAPM and APT models have them as constant. You know, you, you under the unconditional models. So this is uh, deterministic. Uh, and uh, because we're in a simpler framework, we can't have a square root or something here, which would go away from log normal process. And the short wave process has to be a Gaussian process. So it allows any kind of Gaussian models, single, double, triple factor, Heath, Gerald, Morton, Guy Singleton. So if those two assumptions are met, here's a solution. <laughs> Yeah, so I agree with what you wrote, I'm not disagreeing, but um, if, if the only goal is to get a ratio to be log normal, then you don't actually need the numerator to be log normal and the denominator to be log normal. <laughs> they can have a common, you know, random variable that's just going to divide out. <laughs> so, uh, so, okay, so you very, you know, what you wrote is correct, it's sufficient conditions, but by no way right. necessary. <laughs> okay, yeah. No, I, I, you're right, and we don't say it necessary, these are just, yeah. right, right, exactly, that's right, yeah. I, I did think I had some of those thoughts, but you uh, put it very eloquently. But yeah, that's how it would disappear. But but that's why I, I did write sufficient because we've not investigated this properly. There are all these classes of models. What do you call them? The the what are those models called? Where you've got the random the variant, maybe random um, models and all that. You know, where you've got the two dimensional you, Brownian. It's not Brownian motion, but you've got uh, two dimensional Brownian motion random field and Gaussian field, Gaussian field models. So I think this applies even under Gaussian, all of the Gaussian field models are log normal. Most of them are Gaussian basically. So it, this will apply even there, but we don't claim that because we've not been able to prove that completely yet. So we're, uh, we we're looking into that. I think this is, this probably applies even to a Black and Cox model, this trick, I think. We've not proven that. The trick is simply this. The trick is that you take wherever there was the asset price, you make it expected price. 
and wherever there was the numerator's price, you make it expected numerator price everywhere, whether it's in D1, D2, whether it is here. If you just do that trick and leave the wall to be with the way it was, it works. And I have a feeling, this is my conjecture, that if you were to look at the Blacks and, Black and Cox formula, Xiao Yang might, might correct me here if uh, that, or she might have an idea. She's not also not looked at it. But my feeling is that if we were to look at Black and Cox model and just made this change, change all the prices to expected prices, it would work. It would, uh, that formula would become, you know, but we've not proven that. But what, the nice thing about this formula is take Merton's formula, change prices to expected prices in the formula, and that gives you expected call price, which not that easy to see why that should follow, but that works. And I, mean, I think this works only for log normal case. I don't think it is a very general result, but still like, it's kind of a cute result. So I, I did send this to Bob. I've not heard from him. I said, your model generalized to H and I think you might like it. So, so. Anyway, so that was Merton's model. And now here is a uh, Colin Dufresne Goldstein model. These are the processes under the P measure, the underlying asset price process, the short rate process. These are the market prices of risk. And then under the CDG model, the total firm debt follows a stationary mean reporting process, which is given here. This is a total debt. And there's a condition that once you define the log leverage ratio as a log of the, uh, the, the uh, FD term divided by the asset value, and that L will be following this process over here. And basically, when that L uh, uh, hits a, a, a one, you would default and you know, and that is the condition we would use. So then our challenge here is to basically get these processes under the R1T measure, both for the log leverage ratio and for the short rate. And this is what we do. Uh, these are now under R1T measure and the appendix has a whole solution. It looks similar very similar to Colin Dufresne Goldstein solution, which has been extended by uh, an author named Mueller. I've never seen that paper published, but Mueller, he took the CDG model, which had a double summation, and he converted that into a single summation, which saves a lot of computational time. So we go with the approach of Mueller, and it is a very similar solution to Mueller's. So it gives you expected corporate bond price, uh, Oh, zero, this is for zero coupon initially, because if you've got a coupon maturing before horizon, then you have some reinvestment assumptions to be made. So we assume that until the horizon, no coupon is maturing, okay? And uh, if no coupon matures until the horizon, then this would easily work for a coupon bond, just like the CDG model works for the coupon bond. And then in the conclusion sections, we we kind of give some suggestions, you know, if your coupon does mature before horizon, what are some tricks you can do to get the expected price? Because then you need some reinvestment assumption. Mm -hmm. Where would the coupon be invested? Would it be invested in a money market account until H or a pure discount bond until H? You know, you would need those assumptions. Okay, so that basically were some examples of how to use these different R measures. Basically, we looked at R and R1T. Now we look at the R transform basically very similar to the Duffy et al. and the uh, Bakshi and Madan uh, Q transform. So here's a Q transform. The <clears throat> nice thing about this Q transform is that you've got this vector Z, which is an N vector, which is, and then you got N, and then you got Y, uh, which is also an N vector of state variables. And depending upon, upon the boundary conditions, the Z could be anything. Um, did this, you know, nest all kinds of models, whether it is a call option, whether it's uh, different types of boundary conditions can be uh, factored in into this. So it's a very general transform, the generalization. It's like the Heston transform on steroids, you know, it can do many kinds of tricks, many kinds of uh, solutions it can get. And so the only thing we have to do to make an R transform is change the small t to capital H and make the Q into R, and this is it. And that becomes a R measure and happens to be the same as this. P of Q, obviously, 
also this, which is you can get the same thing on only under Q measure. So there were these questions that kept coming, some of the most interesting questions that have come from you also, Peter, and from Husseini, from Hussein, have been these, that why do you need R? And yeah. The screen like, looks pretty good. I guess like the point is, I mean, yeah. well, you have this concept of what you're calling R. Yeah. And, um, you know, like you're choosing to work with yeah. different probability measures, which is, you know, fine. It's a reasonable choice. But yep. I'll just say the alternative is to fix one measure and we, I, you know, you'd probably prefer P, so we'll use P. And, um, and then whenever you want to capture what you're doing, like let's say you're at the later stage when you want to price and then, uh, you know, you basically, you use um, numerators to um, accomplish <laughs> the, the math you're really trying to do, um, which, so, you know, okay, go so ahead. I, I, yeah, we had this discussion and I, I do want to address this in a more detailed way because after weeks, Peter and I exchanged some emails, it was very productive, you know, what we learned, I learned from him. And so, so did these comments began with Husseini last year. He said, why do you need R? This Q does it right here, right? That yeah. Was in, uh, then, you know, <laughs> okay, yeah, he's right. Okay. Then uh, Hussein. Hussein said, why do you need R? You can simply do this using P. In fact, right. this term, this term here, <laughs> this term okay. here turns out to be the stoch future stochastic discount factor. If you multiply this with this, if, if M is the pricing kernel, then M of capital T divided by M of capital H is this whole term, okay? Yeah, so you, yeah. have this, you have a future stochastic discount factor, future because it's M capital T divided by M capital H, not M small t. So it's a future stochastic discount factor uh, multiplied by this, you can do it under P. In fact, your comment about the numerators, what yeah. it turns out is that- So I'm just rewriting M those Ls as numerators, that's all yeah. I'm doing. Yeah. Is that MT by MH is really basically the numerator process. That's what the numerator comes into there. So, you know, the Long's paper is a, it would be the same idea that you can do it under. Yes, P. it would be. Yeah. But th th these are all similar comments, right? The yeah. comment of Long, Hussein's right. comment. Hussein's so, comment. Right. So, so we're in agreement. Like, you know, all four expressions are equally valid. <laughs> okay. They're all but, true. Okay. This, uh, is, uh, this is my comment. They are equally true. But try doing try doing SVJJ model, which is the stochastic volatility double jump model. Try doing that under either Q or P. Try doing that. We found it impossible. Xia Yang spent month, you know, maybe a couple of weeks trying to figure that out, and she's very good with her math skills. Mm -hmm. You cannot make progress because these terms, these terms. Um, they have to be evaluated and then multiply by these terms and you can try them uh, because with, with jumps and all of that, you got to get these uh, expected value of, you, you know, it's, it's an expectation of uh, something evolving at time H with jumps. And this is also evolving with jumps and it becomes horrendously complicated. So you can, uh, she found one way to do Heston, but very, very complicated. You could do this in Hustas Heston. There's a way to yeah. Okay, so but I what think we're let's say, yeah, impossible. let me make this point. Like, you know, there's getting close form formulas, that's one thing. And then there's just, you know, do things exist, so to speak. Okay, and we don't worry about how we calculate things. And um, so on this latter point of view, you know, all four equivalent. And I think what you're focused on is getting close form formulas in particular models. And yes. then I can see that. Like if you, you know, sometimes it's easier to, like if you just compare, for example, the second line with the third line and just say yep. mathematically, what's the difference? <laughs> then mathematically, what's the difference is the second line, yes, has two measures, but let's say the important point about the two measures is the two drifts are different under yep. the two measures. And so, you know, whereas on the third line is only one measure, so only one drift. So, exactly. you know, so, you know, in terms of doing closed form formulas, I can believe that let's say the the higher line, which is basically R, okay, yeah. Um, yeah. is you know is easier, okay. Yeah. So that's what you're saying. 
in yep. terms of getting close to more formulas, it's easier to switch a drift than to, you know, not switch a drift and capture what you're trying to capture by multiplying by something. <laughs> okay, so that's basically what you're saying. And I can believe that's true. And, um, you know, but let's say, yeah, I feel that this emphasis on closed form solutions is a bit misplaced. I mean, it's helpful to give examples and so on, but, but you know, numerically, but to, yeah, there are plenty of models that are used in practice where there's no closed form solution, never will be. <laughs> okay, so, you know, for example, so EGM, okay, you know, with just like realistic volatilities and so on, you know, so so people do them numerically, and your concept is perfectly valid um, when things are done numerically. Okay. But even even numerically, even numerically, if you were to use this Q, and I tried that or P, uh, it would numerically these two would be similar. They're the same actually numerical because yeah. it goes from P to from small. T to yeah, that's just semantics. And, but but this P, okay, but right. this P of Q is R. That is the definition of R. So it is R. Right. And if you use P until H and Q from H onwards, that is what we call R. So, so okay. numerically, first two lines are the same. This, however, is not that easy. If you do this numerically, you would introduce another degree of complexity. Like imagine if this whole thing is the stochastic discount factor, right? So you need to now model stochastic discount factor as a process. And you need to model this too, so you are increase, increasing the complexity numerically. So that complexity does not exist in the first two lines numerically. So numerically, these two are harder to do. Yeah. So it's been your experience that whether it's closed form or numerical, it's better to have like two measures and therefore two drifts than one measure and um, you know let's say an additional random variable. That's right. What you see. Right. But for for closed form solutions, this is the best. For numerical, this and this are sort of equivalent because with numerically you'll you'll generate some Monte Carlo or something using p measure until until h, like I showed you the tree, and then from h you'll generate under q, which is r. So they're identical actually. Numerically, these two equations are yeah, identical. of course, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but when you go this numerically, it's not easy. So this this would be the Long's numerator approach because that would be subsumed here. This will this is where yeah. the stochastic discount factor would come in and your numerator change idea would come in, but that idea will not give you as simple numerical solutions as these two would be. Okay. So that's kind of the point here. So that, that but, but this is such an important point because this has been coming from last year from Fusaini, Usain, you and everybody looked at it because we all want to see if we spent 47 years working with Q, why do we want, we want to work with R? <laughs> it's a fair point. Why can't we just work with Q? So, and, and I think we've tried two solutions, CDG model, we tried to do under Q and P, impossible. You can try it. Uh, you, you definitely need R1T for CDG model. There's no way you will do it under P or Q forward. It just doesn't work. You know? So even though they look like that they'd be similar, it doesn't work. And for SVJJ, these were the two models where we could definitely say very complex. So in a way, the value of R is that there are hundreds of models and that there are hundreds of securities, maybe not literally, but you know, there are huge number of securities and huge number of models. And so, so you get a ton of models, but every time R will work. So in that way, it is very general that uh, regardless of the problem you have, it's always destined to work. So, you know, if Q works, R will work. So that's kind of, okay. I'll continue there. So, so because of so many models, so many securities, we decided to spend another year just deriving solution after solution. So we have 49, 49 pages of appendix with you know, all kinds of solutions, expected option price under the SVJJ model, expected option price under the CGMY, the Peter Cars and other authors, their levy model, expected prices of interest rate derivatives, this is that uh, very, uh, uh, the, the, that nice paper I liked with Chaco and Das, which has, uh, you know, similar to Bakshi and Madan and uh, Duffy Pond Singleton, they've got, but they've specialized that uh, transform approach for interest rate derivatives. And they look at all kinds of interest rate derivatives. So we've generalized, they, they have three classes of interest rate derivatives. And for each one of them, we got different prices. So that's basically uh, what the big appendix does. Here are some of the, uh, this is, this. we did not find space in the paper to put this, 
but we show you uh, some surfaces of uh, the expected call prices and put prices under the SVJJ model, under the SVJ model, which is June Pond. This is DP, the DP, DP Pond single term under the Heston model, which is SV and the Black Shoal model. And something very interesting, you know, call prices always have expected returns, you know, rising generally more than risk risk rate, you know, for risk aversion. But under SVJ, June Pond model and SVJJ, the jump market price of risk is so strong that the expected call price uh, are such that the, that the expected returns would be negative. And this is expected, this is what we call annualized log expected return. Hmm. And the gray area is the, uh, you know, without market price of risk for all models. And uh, well, the, uh, with the market price of risk, uh, under BS and Heston, you get risk aversion. You don't even get risk aversion under SVJ and SVJJ. This is, you know, something interesting. If uh, I wanted your comment, uh, Peter, on this, that uh, if you have a call option, there's a result in Cobble and Shumway that if you hold the call option to maturity and your expected return is less than the risk of rate, right? And if that is true, then you don't have risk aversion. You've got risk seeking at some level going on. So what we're saying is that these famous models, SVJJ of Duffy Pond Singleton and June Pond model, under realistic parameters, are actually not consistent with risk aversion, which I thought was very interesting. That these transformations from P of into Q, they're not giving you some utility out there, which is of a utility of a risk averse investor. If that's not true, then the, can the representative investor even exist? You have to prove that then, you know, because we know representative investor will exist only when there's risk aversion. So there are papers like cumulative prospect theory based uh, model there in which you can have risk seeking and you can get the similar patterns of U-shaped SDF and all of that is a paper in RFS 2019. You get the similar shapes with SVJJ also, but there is no, uh, what is that utility? You know, I'm talking about like, you know, if you were to embed this in an equilibrium model, we don't know what that utility is because it is it has to be risk seeking because call options are negative. So that's a kind of an interesting result, but nothing to do with this paper. And then we show some of these results for uh, put options, ATM puts. Uh, puts are tend to be even more negative. And, and, and the patterns are interesting that uh, generally the action happens with uh, lower maturity and lower horizon. That's where all the big action happens. Other places it is more, more normal, you know? So short-term options and shorter horizons is where you get the extreme results. So anyway, that was the uh, transforms based stuff. Now we're getting into the third section of the paper, which has to do with this new concept of the expected future state price density. It's an extension of Breed and Letzenberger. <clears throat> Assume that the SPD, which is the state price density of an asset at current time T is given by function F, where ST is the future price of this asset. Then uh, to get a future state price density, basically take that F at time H. It's still capital T over here, but this becomes instead of small t, H. And then you take its expectation at small time T and call that, that would depend upon H because this H will be there. And because it is still a state price, it's an expectation of a state price density, which is always a function of capital T, I mean ST. So that'll still be there. So this thing is called the expected future state price density. This is an, like a new concept we're introducing. And this concept is interesting. It has some interesting uh, results that can be derived using this concept. Here's a theorem related to this concept. So this ex expected future state price density happens to be the second derivative of the expected value of a European call option or a put option, second derivative of that with respect to the strike price. Similar to Breeden Litzenberger, which was not expected price, but current price, and then that gives you SPD, and this is expected future state price density. It happens to equal a product of the expected value of the bond price 
and R1T density. That's what this is. It is kind of, and, and this, if you have constant interest rates becomes this. This reminds you of something from the breed in Litzenberger, which was that this G was the state price density. This was basically H was small t, and this was Q. If you remember from breed in Litzenberger, uh, state price density is basically discounted Q density. So similar to that, the expected FSPD is discounted, but discounted only till time H or density. So there's a similarity there. And uh, really, if you look at the breed and Litzenberger in, in its most general case, then it's really not Q density. What they really show is that the state price density is a forward density times the bond price. So this is kind of you know the analog to the Breeden Litzenberger under stochastic interest rates. This is analog to Breeden Litzenberger under constant interest rates. That would be that. Now you said uh, constant, but you probably meant deterministic. Um, sorry, determinist, deterministic. Yes, I meant deterministic, not constant interest rates. Yeah, the very good point. And so, so those are the these are the things that I pointed out just now. So this would be Breeden Litzenberger um, when when small when small t equals to capital H, this is what you get. Small t equals capital H, this is what you would get. These are the special cases of the previous two equations. Now, um, here are the two major results. The expected FSPD can get the expected price of an arbitrary complex European claim using expected prices of standard European OTM calls and puts. So this is one result, which will be corollary three. And the other result is that the expected FSPD can give you the physical density that everybody's been searching for, including all the recovery theorems. Of course, this is not as ambitious as recovery theorems. Recovery theorems try to get you everything just using today's prices. We do need expected returns of calls and puts, so, so it's not the same thing, but it can get you just a no arbitrage result, nothing to do with any assumptions that Ross makes and other people make in recovery theorems. It's just by no arbitrage, expected FSPD will give you physical density using expected terminal prices of standard European OTM calls and puts. We don't need higher order moments, only the first moment. I don't need second moment, third moment. We, you gave me the first moment of, uh, of the standard European OTM and put returns, just the first moment moment. Uh, and if it is true, then I'll give you the physical density. That's what this is saying, you know, using the expected FSPD concept. So those are the two main results. And it's because this is the key thing in these results, the expected, you know, call price or, or put price, we separate that into two terms. One is, you know, today's price multiply by what we have called, we call this as a, this is the uh, expected simple call return. So just C times one plus that, this is obviously backward looking because how do you get this expected return? Um, you have to look at backward data and all of the recovery theorems don't wanna look at the backward data. So that's the criticism of this, but you only look at the first moment. You know, if you give me one moment, then I can give you the entire physical density. So this is forward looking. This is backward look, looking, it is not, it, it is still useful because this is stationary. Once you estimate this, this is given. Now every day this keeps changing. Today, this was some values. Tomorrow it's gonna to be different values. This remains the same, let's say, or if it is conditional, it might also depend on some state, state variables, but this doesn't change as much. You know, It depends on preferences. It is not so changing, all the time. but this will be changing all the time, CT and PT. As today new information comes in, CT changes, that changes this. And as that changes this, in the previous slides, we had all the results depending on these expectations, which gave you the expected uh, future state price density. So basically what we're saying is that we are looking for, we are using the forward looking information day by day in changing the expected FSPD, which is used in estimating the the expected prices of complex claims and physical density. So this approach does not require making strong parametric assumptions like all the parametric models like Bates and uh, all the, you know, uh, Duffy-Pond-Singleton and all of those models that are empirical models. 
you can use uh, simpler models that use semi semi parametric assumptions like Corval Shumway or some factor models like Israel Loeb and Kelly. You know, so we're not in the world of you know Heston and SVJ. If you can just somehow get expected call returns for different strikes using some kind of a semi parametric model, which will need historical data, but you're not using these because you don't want to make strong assumptions about the, about the physical probabilities. You only want to make assumptions about the first moment. If you do that and you get this, then you can use uh, basically you get these and you get these and you can get physical density and you can get complex European claim prices. So that's the third part of the paper. This is the corollary three. So this is the expected FSPD. The HAS could be very nonlinear. It could be any claim. And you just need this. And once you have this, you can just put a single line integral and you could get the solution of the expected future price of any nonlinear European claim. Corollary four, give, corollary four gives you the result about the physical density. So it's the same uh, expected future state price, uh, uh, dense, uh, uh, ex expected future state price density, but it is the it is evaluated at capital T. So it is the FSPD, expected terminal FSPD, that's what it is basically. So H equals to capital T. As soon as you make H equals to capital T, you get physical density. So just using the first moment of calls and puts at the option expiration that returns first moment, this is a no arbitrage result. I'm surprised something as simple as, it's kind of as very basic. You know, like, like it show, fundamentally connects option uh, expectations to asset return expectations. And it's a very basic result. So I'm a little surprised that this, nobody, you know, pointed this out before it, it's kind of implied by, by some of the results that Brody and Chernoff found, you know, it's, it's implied in this report. So uh, now our only difference about using historical data is that when you apply recovery theorems, uh, like Ross and other papers, then uh, Jackworth and Menor, uh, they found, they tested Ross and its extensions and they found very poor results. They, they, they tested all its, the three, four extensions of Ross. And basically they found that, you know, you would think that if there is a method that is using current information, which is supposed to be better than historical information, that is conditioning on current information, giving you physical density, would work at least as good as historical probabilities, at least, and it should beat that. It should actually compete with conditional models. This is where we should be going. But what they found that Ross recovery and all these extensions don't even do as good as the historical uh, data does in predicting physical probabilities. So if it doesn't even meet that bar, then I personally feel historical data is useful. You, know, you cannot you know, just use today's prices and try to get of physical probabilities. Historical data has certain patterns how investors behave over and over again. So there is some useful information about how their behavior and that forms prices. So, so our method does require historical data, but it, so it's not as ambitious as Ross, but Ross is very ambitious, but it really doesn't lead to much. You know, when you test it empirically, there's nothing there. So anyway, I will conclude the paper here and then we can take more questions. So the main motivation was that an important gap remains in the understanding of expected prices and expected returns of continuing claims. We propose a theoretical framework to fill this gap. We propose the equivalent expectation measures as generalizations of EMMs. We propose our transforms as generalizations of Q transforms, solve the analytical solutions of expected prices under various types of contingent claim models. And we derive the expected future state price density, which allows the estimation of expected future prices of complex European contingent claims, as well as the physical density of the underlying assets future price. I should continue using the first moment of the European standard European call and put returns. And future applications uh, for parametric models can be made using R, because now you've got an analytical solution that has both P and Q parameters and just one solution. So suppose you apply the GMM and MCMC method, you could in one shot get both P and Q parameters. So, you know, so we've not investigated all the 
empirical implications of this, but I'm sure it'll open up a host of uh, research ideas with changing horizon and uh, getting more robust estimates of P and Q using different horizons. Right now, you're only limited to the terminal date or current value, but now you have all the horizons in between two day horizon, three day horizon, one week horizon, all of that can be used with liquid options. So there'll be some future applications which will lead to more robust estimations of P and Q parameters, which basically give you R parameters. So that's the paper and uh, I can- Okay, uh, yeah, so all right, uh, so uh, thank you. So- um, you, you have gone on much beyond the uh, one yeah. hour? One hour was the limit? Yeah, it's okay. Um, um, yeah, I, I want to make one comment you might like. Um, yeah. So, you know, so, um, you know, we'll say what you're thinking is that, um, you know, you have a derivative of security, let's say it lasts a year and you want to know the expected return over the next three months, say, right? Yeah. Or expected price, let's say expected price. Yeah. Okay, so that's fine. So that's perfectly valid as a thing you want to do. So I, I want to just point out that there are other problems that are possibly of interest. So you have a due security, it lasts a year. And, um, you know, I'm going to take its payoff and um, I'm going to invest in something. And all I want to know is what is the expected value under P of what I have in two years? Okay. So, okay. So that's a reasonable question too. And um, so the, um, you know, so you're, you know, you're only coming backward in time and um, I'm proposing you think about going forward in time as well. Um, mathematically, yep. the word I'm using, the mathematically it's called an adjoint, what I'm doing. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the, um, so in, just in the pricing, and I know you're interested in expected values under P, but just in pricing, make the comment that there's not only backward equations like that you're familiar with, like Black Scholes PD but so-called forward equations that go forward in maturity, okay, rather than backward in calendar time. So right. those are adjoint to each other. And so what I'm saying is there's an adjoint of your R, <laughs> okay? Right. Right. The notation is called the R star, but anyway, that would be very confusing given you're using R star for other things. But anyway, um, so, so, you know, so for your next paper, I want you to work out the theory of, uh, of, uh, of adjoints of R, um, okay, where, you, where basically you're moving you know, you're sitting at time zero, you're pushing a maturity date forward. And yep. at first you're working under Q. Um, yep. And then, because, you know, and then, at, you know, when let's say a claim matures, you're gonna take the payoff and put it in something. So let's just do a concrete example. So the simplest yep. concrete example would be, you know, we know that the, um, the futures price of a stock in for a maturity day of the futures in one year is the futures price $100. <laughs> and, you know, mathematically, that's the expectation of the Q of the, of the underlying. And yep. um, and then, you know, I know that I, when I get this, um, after the futures matures, I'm gonna, just gonna take, I'm just gonna, you know, invest in the underlying and just hold it. And, um, and um, you know, I wanna know what is the expectation under P um, of what I'm gonna have um, when I do this. So, so, you know, I'm just thinking that you could reverse everything time-wise. Really good point, yeah. First do Q, then do P, rather than the other way around. So, okay, anyway. So no, that, that is, that is yeah. a very good point. Yeah, we should think about that more. And only other comment I would make is that we only did this for the first moment expected, but mm -hmm. there's a whole world of risk return analysis. Yeah, true. So that the now we'll be doing the second moment and, you know, so- Yeah, that, that one of your chat comments was about that. Like, so yeah. it was my, my clip count, just paraphrase them. So, you know, so of course, when you're doing this R calculation, you need, you know, let's say you're doing it for a stock, like you were thinking, as the yeah. underline, you need to know the expected return under P of the stock. But, yeah. and so, you know, obviously that's a hard thing to estimate from data, right. but at least the good news is, you know, if you're trying to calculate the three month return on a one year option, yeah. at least you only need to know the expected return on the underlying stock for three months. <laughs> you don't need to know it for longer. So at least the good news is, I mean, you're probably a little more luck trying to think about expected returns in the near future than the far future. <laughs> okay, you know, it's just so right. Right, right, right. Whereas what I was proposing was adjoint thing. <laughs> I would actually have you propose <laughs> you try to get expected returns under P in the far future. So that's even that's really hard. Okay.
So, yeah. so, um, so there's estimation risk in, of course, what you're doing. Um, but yes. you know, we knew that. So, okay. All right, good. Okay, let's wrap up. So it's 7.30 if you want to have dinner. And um, thanks so much, Sanjay. Thank, um, you. Thank you, Peter, for it. And I, I wish I told you to remind me when it was just 10. To, to yeah, I should have. I was just too entranced by what you were doing. Okay, all right. So, so thank um, you all. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I really appreciate this and your comments, and especially, Peter, your comments have been wonderful. I mean, I've been enjoying the discussion with you from day one. So so thank you for, okay, for that. Let's keep in touch. Yeah. Now, okay, bye, touch. everyone. Take care. Bye, everybody. Uh, Namisha, you can end the recording. Okay.